So uh, I've got a question for you as we begin this morning, and uh, I want you to think about this question and think about how you would answer it and if you would feel comfortable answering it. Um, the question is this. Do you ever find yourself in a conversation with somebody uh, and, and without even maybe recognizing it or knowing it, all of a sudden you're saying, I'm a Christian, uh, but I'm not that kind of Christian? Like, do you find yourself in that, like, you're in a conversation with somebody and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, but wait, 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 like, just let me define what I mean by Christianity here. Like, just give me a second. Because you know, for some reason, like, you know that that conversation is going to take a turn and you're not sure whether it's going to be a good turn or uh, less of a good turn um, because of that, of that moment. And listen, maybe it's because you've just said, sorry, like, Sunday doesn't work for me. Maybe you're in a conversation with a boss and you're like, I just, I can't work on Sunday because that's time I've set aside to worship and I need to be at church and I need to be with community and I need to be uh, at a particular place at a particular time. And you get a sideways look like, okay, all right, that's your, that's your commitment. Okay. Uh, maybe it's a conversation with a neighbor who you know is not a Christian and you have these conversations sort of repeatedly throughout the days and weeks and months and years and we're turning toward Christmas. Maybe it's just sort of naturally comes up again. Uh, but you know, like this neighbor, not a Christian, particular views about what or who a Christian is. Um, even more so I know, and listen, I talked to some of you about this, family members with very strong views about who Christians are and what Christians do and what they are always like. They're just conversations. They're conversations that we have, and so you find yourself in a situation, uh, like I did, maybe you're in a drive-thru, um, and the barista asks you what you do, uh, and you say you're a pastor, and you're not quite sure that they backed up to get your coffee that was ready, or because they're a little bit concerned, like this thing might be contagious. Like, I'm not quite sure how to, how to handle it, right? Like, conversations. I'm guessing you've had to qualify what you mean when you say, I'm a Christian. And in case you're wondering, I don't love that this seems to be where we've landed with Christianity, with culture, society in the West. I don't love it. The funny thing is, is that I'm sure many of you have had these types of experiences. I'm sure many of you have had these types of conversations that you've been through and you kind of walk away and you're like, how did I handle that? What could I have said differently? And the reality is that for all of us here who have had those conversations, for as many of us has had that moment there are also different perspectives on Christian theology, different flavors, different uh, approaches to things like discipleship, mission evangelism, like things that we do as a church. Like it's not one particular flavor of Christian who gets to claim that they are always the one in these conversations, right? You could be progressive Christian and you find yourself having to qualify what you mean when you say Christian, like this and I just need to lay this out. You could be conservative as you, in, your, in your faith and your views and you could find yourselves equally in a moment where you say, listen, like I, I just, I need, to, I need to qualify, I need to define what I mean when I say Christian. It's, it's not just progressive Christians, it's not just conservative Christians, it's all flavors of Christians who feel this need to qualify what they mean. My guess is that every single one of us has felt that at one point or another. You know, one of the most common critiques leveled against Christians today and against the church today is that it's full of hypocrites. How many of you have heard that critique before? Christianity, church, full of hypocrites. People who are play-acting, Hypocrite, that word, right? And we've talked about this in the years past. It, it means to put on a mask. And it means to intentionally play act. That's where that word arises and it's used over and over again to, to talk about people who were play acting. Literally in the theater for a while and then also in the church and in faith and in religion. People who put on a mask in order to engage with the world because you don't really want people to see what you're like behind, behind that mask. Right? People who aren't living a truly integrated life who say one thing and, and then who do another, and who constantly feel like, well, it's just I'm not quite sure who, who you are. One of the key markers pointed to in these research studies over and over again that led to this perspective on Christians were that we Christians, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, we are ones who judge others. Barna, which is a research organization who does a lot of study, uh, to, in order to help churches, both like to help churches grow, to help us understand who we are and how we are perceived and, and all of these sort of all of these places, arenas of study. They did a study a number of years ago to see whether or not self-proclaimed Christians had actions and attitudes that more identified them with Jesus or with the Pharisees. 
Okay, with, with Jesus in scripture in the New Testament, as Jesus lives, as he acts, his attitudes and his actions toward the world, toward people, or the Pharisees, the teachers, the keepers of the law, and if you don't know who they are, they're the people Jesus is the hardest on in scripture, over and over and over again. And some of the questions that they came up with, they, they d- developed this long list of questions, and I, we're gonna put maybe a few on the screen, uh, just a few of them. Questions that helped you identify, or statements that help you identify actions and attitudes like Jesus, actions and attitudes like the Pharisees. So actions that were like Jesus included things like this. I listened to others to learn their story before telling them about my faith. Things like I regularly choose to have meals with people with a very different faith or morals from me. I try to discover the needs of non-Christians rather than waiting for them to come to me. I am personally spending time with non-believers in order to help them follow Jesus. These were actions that aligned with Jesus in the Gospels. Attitudes, like I see God-given value in every person regardless of their past, their present, or their condition. It is more important to me to help people know that God is for them than to make sure they know they are sinners. I feel compassion for people who are not following God and doing immoral things. Those were actions and attitudes that aligned with Jesus. What about self-righteous actions or actions and attitudes that align more with the Pharisees? That included things like, I tell others the most important thing in my life is following God's rules, but I also don't talk about my sins or my struggles. That's between me and God. I like to point out those who do not have the right theology or doctrine I prefer to serve people who attend my church rather than those outside the church. And some of the attitudes included finding it hard to be friends with people who seem to constantly do the wrong thing, being grateful to be a Christian when I see others' faults and failures. People who follow God's rules are better than those who don't. And so you can start to feel the tension. You can start to maybe feel a, a little bit of discomfort And what they found in this study, we're gonna put a a chart on, is the results of this. This is like self-proclaiming Christians, followers of Jesus, answering the questions of themselves for themselves. Of the people who answered, over 51% or 51% landed more inside that fourth or whichever quadrant you would call attitudes and actions of the Pharisees, right? And I think the natural reaction, because I remember seeing this when it came out, when it was first published. I think the natural reaction to see that is to begin to do what? And to defend why you don't fall into the, the 51% category, right? And maybe what you start to do or what starts to happen to creep in is like you start to think of or begin a list of all of the people, everybody you know who does. You're like, okay, all right, let's figure out who the 51% is. Like you start to catalog, catalog a list of, of people. Comparison is a killer. But the reality is that for some reason, like our brains are wired, we're naturally wired for comparison. I recently read a book that described it as our brains trying to measure uh, our own success. We compare ourselves to others because we are trying to figure out whether or not we are making any progress, whether or not we are, are moving in the direction we want to move in, whether or not we are succeeding. And, and so you, you, you do, you naturally grab on to the people and things and places around you and you start to compare yourself to other people because it gives you something to measure. We're naturally wired for it. How do I know that I'm winning? And it starts to sound like this, well, I'm better off than, insert name here. At least I'm not as bad as, you know, insert another name over here. And the painfully ironic thing is that as soon as you start to do that, as soon as I start to do that, I know exactly where I land. The good news, though, is that Jesus loves you. God's for you. And there is a way forward. Because here's the other thing that I believe to be true about you, about me, about us, about people, is that I think very few people wake up every morning and commit to being more judgmental like the Pharisees. Right, very few people wake up and they're like, hey, today, man, today I'm aiming at Pharisee. Like, probably not. I think many of us, most of us, every single one of you, like 10 for 10, would wake up wanting to live a life of love and not a life 
of judgment, to be known by how you love, than to be known by how you judge. And so Jesus says in, in Matthew 7, he puts it plainly, he says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Man, it's a challenging passage. Like, can I just say, like, that's, it's one of those lines. So Jesus has just prayed in the Lord's Prayer, like, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are our debtors, right, or who sin against us. Difficult passage to live out. You're like, man, this is hard. It hits hard. Uh, don't judge or you'll be judged with the measure you used it will be measured to you sounds very similar why do you look he says why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye how can you say let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye you hypocrite and that's the word first take the plank out of your own eye and, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw away your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under your feet and turn and tear you to pieces. I don't know if you found this to be true in life right now, in our cultural moment, but it seems to me like we've gotten pretty good at uh, offending one another. At offending one another, at being offended. Um, I, don't need to, you know, I don't need to do anything other than, than drive myself from my house to here in order to, to feel that in order to experience it. And so maybe it's in the car, or maybe it's at work, or maybe it's at the grocery store in line, or maybe it's waiting for something, or you know, it could be for a whole lot of different reasons. I don't know if any of you are going to the Grey Cup, but you, know, you might have to wait in a whole lot of lines. Like it's just like, we, we've gotten pretty good at offending and that being offended. And in sort of rolls Jesus with this like grenade. He says, why do you look at the speck of, of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. And so, listen, like this is not well thought out, but I don't know if you've thought about it um, or if I thought about this too much, but like Jesus is saying, listen, like there's a plank in your eye and I'm, very, I'm just, I'm not gonna, Bruce, I won't knock your piano, okay? I won't knock the keyboard. So he was like, here's Jesus. He says, listen, like you're worrying about the sawdust in, in somebody else's eye, in your brother's eye, in your sister's eye, and you have a plank in your own eye. And you can kind of picture what, what would happen, right? You approach somebody, and uh, my cousin is here, so I won't hit you with the, with the plank, but you can approach a person. You're like, hey, let me take the sawdust out of your eye. You've got something there, and you can picture how, how it plays out. And, and, like, it's a comical illustration. Jesus is saying, listen, you're walking around with a plank in your eye. There's a really good chance that there's something in your own life that, that you can't see, but that everybody else does. A and worse, you know, that as you approach people to help them, and listen, like, I'm not even, like, I don't even think that it's out of a bad intention. You, but even if you try to approach somebody with the best intentions to help and to heal, you're gonna crank them in the face. So he says, listen, you gotta stop. You gotta take the plank out of your own eye first. That's kind of uh, the reality of having something in your eye. I don't know the last time was when you had something in your eye. That's why I gave up contact lenses and started wearing glasses all the time. It's like natural level of protection. Like it hurts. You also can't see it. Like by definition, something is in your eye. You can't see it with your eye, at least for the most part. Sometimes, I don't know if you get those floaters, but like it's there and you can't see it. And, and the problem is that every single one of us, we're walking around with planks sticking out of our eyes. We're cranking into each other. We can't see what's going on in our own lives. We judge other people as though we were perfect. Or we walk around trying to help and fix somebody else's life. And we can't see what's going on in our own. And that was Jesus' concern. Judging, living toward others from a place of moral superiority from a high ground that says I've got it all figured out and you gotta you know you will eventually you might but you don't right now chapter 7 and we're not going to wrap it up today but chapter 7 wraps up the sermon on the mount we've been preaching and talking our way through and the sermon it follows this trajectory okay uh, it calls people to move this is like high level 40,000 foot view but it calls people to move from crowd 
observer to disciple, to follower of Jesus, right? From outside observer, one who kind of watches from a distance, to follower, one who is close and learning, to disciple, to apprentice, to one who is trying to become more like Jesus. That's the call of the Sermon on the Mount. And the trajectory goes, you're called into this new life of of being, of becoming a follower of Jesus, and a lot happens, but what does happen is your life starts to be oriented in a new direction. You start to become like a new person. You point your life toward Jesus, and part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, part of what it means to be an apprentice is to become more like Jesus, to spend time learning the way Jesus is and was with people. And, And what Jesus does through the sermon is paint a picture of how now to live not outside the kingdom, but inside the kingdom of heaven. Of what it means to be and become a follower, a Christian, someone who is inside of the kingdom, who is living into the kingdom, essentially of how to be different than the world. And that is the call. You move from a place of being outside observer to inside follower of Jesus, and I don't love that language, but you become one who is called to be different. Jesus calls you to respond. He calls you to follow. He calls you to live into a new reality. He calls you to be given a new identity. Uh, But he says you've got to remember the entire goal, the whole purpose of it not just for your own personal salvation, not just so that you can feel good about who you are and worry about whether or not you're gonna go to heaven when you die, like those are pieces and parts of a much bigger story that God is writing. And he says, uh, listen, like you have been called in many ways so that the world can benefit. And remember we painted a picture of the parallel trajectory of the people of Israel being called and set apart so that the entire world around them would benefit. And he says, hey, Christian follower of Jesus, church, new community of faith, called to live so that the world around you can benefit. Um, Stanley Harawas puts it like this. He says, to be a follower of Jesus entails nothing less than becoming a visible alternative to the world. I like that language. Christians belong to Jesus and not the world. Now Jesus is saying, but don't for a second let this new identity allow you to think that you are better than anybody else. Don't allow it to let you think that you can judge anybody out of a place of superiority, spiritual, moral superiority. He says, don't judge, or you too will be judged. Judgment usually connotes indictment condemnation, these things as they play out. I think Jesus is beginning to challenge us and say to us, listen, like, don't let your new identity as a follower of Jesus, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, all that you have, all that you've become, allow you or worse be the reason you judge the actions of others. In Jesus' economy, there are those living as followers of Jesus, lives pointed in a specific direction, and there are those who aren't. That's just the way things are. Those who are living into the kingdom of heaven and its values and its ethics and those who aren't. And it's not the job of those inside the kingdom to judge those outside according to the values and ethics of the kingdom. Right? As, as simple as I can put it, when was the last time you knew someone who was judged into a life-changing relationship with Jesus? who was condemned into a life-giving relationship with Jesus. Because I, like, I can't think of anybody, at least not immediately. Jesus continues like this. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And maybe you read this, and you can. You can read this uh, verse and feel incredibly convicted, but also maybe a little bit worried. And fear can start to creep in, right? Like in the same way you judge others, you're going to be judged. In the same measure you use, it will be measured. And it's entirely possible that you need to feel that discomfort. And if you are feeling that discomfort, I would simply say, allow yourself to feel it for a minute. Don't just simply dismiss it. But I think there's equally a picture here of the gospel, right? There's a picture here that offers hope in the face of fear and judgment, And listen, like without getting into all of it, and I think I've maybe mentioned this even in sermons, but like my grandmother died because she grew up in a church 
that made her feel like she was never quite sure whether or not God loved her and she was saved. She died in abject fear that she was not one of the elect, one of the chosen. And, and so I listen, like I think there's a picture of the gospel here that does offer hope and that doesn't necessarily always and need to lead to fear and judgment. Scripture says you will be judged. Like that's, it's throughout the entirety of the picture of the gospel, you will be judged. But the hope of the gospel is that you are gonna be judged based on the accomplished works of Christ. Based on what Jesus did through his life, through his ministry, through his teaching, through his death and through his resurrection. You stand judged, I stand judged based on what Christ accomplished. Listen, the picture you have of God changes the way you position yourself toward the world. If you see God as judgmental en route to like condemning, there's a good chance that you're gonna act in ways that are judgmental and condemning. But the picture that the New Testament paints is of a God who offers grace and a God who offers mercy and a God who is about love and forgiveness, not because he refuses to judge, but because he places himself squarely in the position of the accused. Christ stands judged. Jesus stands accused in my place, in your place. And that's the hope at the end of the day of the gospel is that God is judge but he's also the one who is accused. Again, I find myself quoting uh, Stanley Hauerwas throughout this series because he writes beautifully on the Gospel of Matthew. He says the disciples, and I think he would include you here too, the disciples are not to judge because any judgment that needs to be made has already been made. See, the inverse of that line with the measure that you used, it will be measured to you is grace. It's unmerited favor. Like the Christian is one who stands with the knowledge that you have received grace. You have received unmerited favor and you are now called to live out that same grace toward the world. In his early letter to the church, uh, this beginning sort of baby infant church forming in Rome, Paul puts it like this. He says, who then is the one who condemns? Who's in a position? Who is in a place to condemn? Only Christ. He says, no one is. Only Christ. Christ who died. More than that, Christ who was raised to life and, in, and is at the right hand of God and who is also interceding for us, for you, who prays on your behalf, who mediates between you and, and God. Listen, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, I hope you know the measure with which you have been judged is grace. It's mercy and it's love. And so the gospel calls you to live from that place, to live a life of love and of non-judgment. Jesus wraps up in a beautiful way. He says, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It looks, I think, a lot like participating in a community that allows us to name our sins and calls us to confession. So Jesus' alternative to a community of judgment isn't a community without accountability or without authenticity or where we all just kind of hole up and hide away for ourselves. That's the exact thing he's calling out. He says, go. Take the plank out of your eye. And it's like the prototype statement for the airplane oxygen mask directions, right? Like you're no good to anybody. You're no good to anybody walking around with a plank in your own eye and you're no good to yourself. That's not life, it's, it's not love, it's not experiencing the fullness that God calls you into. So he says, go, take the plank out of your eye. Unless you do, all you're gonna, all you're gonna do is offend and, and be offended. Your plank is gonna, it's gonna hurt somebody else. So Jesus says, listen, learn to remove it. And I think it looks like learning a discipline of confession, of naming your sins, naming your struggles, name what you long for to change in your own life, like name just what you are looking toward and, and pointing your life toward. And it's just, man, like, this is what I'm longing, this is what I'm after, this is what I would love for God to do. Come before God with a repentant heart and allow God to show up 
and point out where the plank is in your own eye. And as a result, what's gonna happen is that you'll learn to live a life of love and you're gonna learn to live a life of generosity toward others and you're gonna live, or learn to live rather a life of gratitude for what God has done and is doing in your life toward those around you. Even better, I think you'll be in a position to help somebody else with the sawdust in their own eye. You'll be able to help. You'll be able to heal and not to hurt. John Paul II says this about confession. He says, confession is an act of honesty and courage. I like that. It's an act of entrusting ourselves beyond sin to the mercy of a loving and forgiving God. And so the way I want to end this morning, at least end the sermon this morning, is by reading for you a prayer of confession. And I'm not going to invite you to shout out your own confessions. I'm going to invite you to pray uh, into the quietness of your own heart and your own mind and then to contemplate going away and having a good conversation with somebody else. This is a prayer of confession that was written by a church, a denomination, who many, many people have prayed over the years. And so I, I didn't write it. And I think there's power and beauty in that. But let's pray this prayer together. I'd invite you to confess and to learn to talk to God about what's going on in your life. It says, O eternal God and merciful, merciful Father, we drop to our knees in your presence and we confess our wrongs. We confess our spiritual bankruptcy. We know that your merciful arms are infinite, reaching out to hold whoever comes. And so we are encouraged, deeply moved, to call out for your help because we trust in Jesus Christ, our mediator and sacrifice, one who takes away the sin of the world. And so we pray, please, Lord, forgive us all our sins for Christ's sake. Look with compassion upon us and wash us in the fountain of Jesus' blood. Cover us, we pray, with Christ's innocence and righteousness. And as we take a fresh start, give us new minds and eager hearts. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.